friend, and hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor, your host, where I have yet another car review. This time in a bit of a rainy, cloudy day here in Cowlin, I am reviewing the 2023 Toyota BZ4X. This is the LE, the mid-trim spec version here in Canada. I'm very excited to have this. Only had it for a few days, so I can't do a lot of in-depth stuff, but I will give you my summary on it. First off, I want to start, as always, thanking the OEMs. Uh, thank Toyota Canada for allowing me the use of this press vehicle for a few days. Uh, appreciate that. So that's a good looking vehicle, as you can see. Let me give you my thoughts. Now, if we look first about the design of this, this is a, definitely a Toyota design. You know, they've taken their already RAV4 and their other uh, uh, vehicles, a Prius, all that design language, and put it into their first all-electric offering, this BZ4X. And um, if you're not aware, this is the same joint platform that they've worked on with, with Subaru. So you'll see the Subaru Solterra use the same uh, all-electric uh, new platform, as well as Toyota with the BZ4X, as well as Lexus, which is Toyota's higher end division with the RZ or RZ 450E, which I will have in a couple of weeks as well to review for a few days. So you'll probably hear a lot of similarities between this and the Lexus uh, when I get a chance to review that now. So really this has kind of the sizing and the design of a RAV4. But you know, with no grill, you can just block out the entire nose and make it a bit more bulbous that's the right word. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's got a nice design language, very similar to the Lexus styles as well, especially in the tail lights. So there's a lot of familiarity in the elements on this vehicle. It doesn't stand out and scream too much that I'm an electric other than the big um, front end that it has with no grill, obviously. Uh, but I've had a few uh, heads turned on this as I'm driving by. Nothing too extravagant. It blends in very nicely. And if that's what you want from Toyota and as an all electric vehicle, you will get it in this design language. So I like this design language. I don't mind it at all. I think it looks pretty good. And uh, I think they've done a good job with this entry uh, that you see here. All around, the lights, everything. It's just a nice package. The lights work well. They're LED up front, LED in the back, I believe. Everything just works. It's, you know, um, it's Toyota, right? You know, they're going to be more conservative, going to be a very higher quality, build quality, all that stuff's going to be there. And it shows, no panel gaps. It's a really nice looking vehicle, comes in some nice colors. And being that they gave me the mid Trex, the mid uh, spec trim on this, this is the LE. Um, this isn't the top spec. I thought it's pretty well equipped for what you get. And I'm going to go into pricing and stuff near the end of this. But wrapping up the design, it's got 18 inch tires, a very, very nice ride on this, comfortable, not luxurious, comfortable, but you're not going to be thrown around like a sports car either in this thing. So it's got a good all purpose ride on it. They've done a good job. All right, so pop the hood open. As you can see, there is no frunk in this. It's this uh, uh, two base trims here in Canada. The L and the LE, both are front wheel drive, single motor offering. So the motor is here along with all the electronics, the inverter, the cooling, all that kind of stuff. So it kind of looks like an engine, but it's not. Got the 12 volt. So everything's easily accessible here, which is one thing that's nice for servicing. So as I mentioned, the, the, the base two uh, models, the L and the LE here in Canada, uh, trim specs are front wheel drive. The XLE is their all wheel drive offering. And I'm gonna tell you some of the differentiations on that. From a horsepower perspective, the um, single motors pump out 201 horsepower and 196 pound feet of torque. And the all-wheel drive dual motor just pushes it up a little bit more. It's not a whole lot more with 214 horsepower and 248 pound-feet of torque. You'll, you'll really feel it a little bit more off the line there. But what that does is it pushed this vehicle to 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in about 7 seconds or just under 7 seconds, which is more than adequate for a nice family hauler, basically. So now we continue with the powertrain offering. This is where it gets a little bit different on the BZ4X here offering from uh, Toyota. As I mentioned, it's got the two trims, the L and the LE, which are both front wheel drive offerings, and then the XLE, which is all wheel drive. So on the front wheel drive offerings, both in North America and in Europe, they have a different battery pack than the all wheel drive offering. So which is a little confusing. They're pretty close. It's a 71.4 kilowatt hour for the front wheel drive variants. Uh, and these are Panasonic cells, so I believe they're cylindrical cells in the pack. If you go to the all-wheel drive version, it's a 72.8 kilowatt hour size pack, but they're from CATL, so a different manufacturer, and I believe they're pouch uh, cells. Both are great battery manufacturers. They're 
providing batteries all over the world. As you know, Panasonic's been doing Teslas for years, so they all know their stuff. It's just interesting how that Toyota has decided to go with two different pack manufacturers, cell manufacturers on their models because it does offer a difference, not only in the range, obviously, that's going to be uh, known, but for charging. Um, as far as range goes on these, I'll talk about that first. The single motor is EPA rated at 406 kilometers for both uh, trims, and the um, all-wheel drive version is rated at 367 kilometers, so about 10% uh, drop or so in range with that all-wheel drive. Again, those battery packs are so close to being the same. Now, where those packs again play a difference is on the charging side. Now, the vehicle itself, all trims support, that's what I'm trying to say, a 6.6 .6 kilowatt uh, AC charger, so for level one, level two. So certainly good enough to charge this up overnight, eight to 10 hours kind of thing, usually for your level two. So no problem in home charging, uh, workplace charging to a point as well. You can get many hours on this. And, and level one, again, is a trickle charge, gonna take you a couple of days. What's different is the fast charging. And that's why I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking on because that can be that's pretty important for a lot of people that want to buy EVs and that want to do road tripping. You can do road tripping in the BZ4X, and if you go online, you'll see a lot of negative videos about about that topic. Um, so I'm here to tell you you can do it, right? You can do it with the Nissan Leaf. You can do it with a lot of vehicles out there, but you need to be aware of what that charging experience is going to be like. So that's the difference. Doing something and knowing how it's going to be are two different things, right? So any EV out there pretty well will do road tripping. But if you, not, you need to understand how long it's going to take for you to stop and do a charge to get you to your next charge or next destination in a reasonable amount of time at a reasonable distance. This can certainly do that. And the difference in these packs has to do with the fast charging. The Panasonic packs, so on the front wheel drive uh, variant, offerings of the BC4X support up to 150 kilowatts of peak fast charging. The CATA, the CATL pack on the all-wheel drive version supports up to 100. So when you put that into, into context in this vehicle and you map that in with Toyota's ultra, ultra conservative fast charging algorithms, again, this is their first all-electric offering, right? They've been dealing in plug-in hybrids for years. They, they, they know that market, they should know that battery market, but they are being their usual ultra, ultra conservative. In, in our opinion, my opinion and many other car people and EV guys uh, and gals opinions, I think a bit too conservative in providing enough juice to the battery to get consumers a decent charging experience, especially with today's standards. And I'm talking about standards like 10 to 80 in 20 to 30 minutes, right? That's kind of the new norm. Now, some people, um, you know, I've got some data here from Kyle at Out of Spec. I love you, Kyle. You know that. You're great. I watch your stuff. I, get, I learn a lot from you and I get a lot of information from you. I don't necessarily agree that you need to charge it up to 100%. I'm great. I'm glad you're doing those tests. But I can tell you that most of the owners that I talk to, yes, they may start a little bit less than 10%, but most of them don't go past 85%. It's kind of 80 to 85. So that 10 to 80, I think, is still a very realistic DC road tripping fast charging spot if you're stopping at a hotel overnight then plug it into level two and get 10 hours or whatever get it but when you're road tripping you know you kind of want to be driving for two and a half to three and a half to four hours and then stop for that 20 to 30 minutes even 40 minutes that's kind of the acceptable window and that's kind of the experience one would get with today's vehicles like the south koreans like the vw's like the audis the porsches the teslas and on and on with their charging uh, algorithms and the way that they pull speed those are the kind of experiences you would get now, where Toyota is, has differentiated this vehicle, unfortunately, is in offering a slower charging algorithm and makeup to their charging curve. They could no doubtedly pull more, more uh, request more power and pull more power into this battery pack, but they choose not to. I don't think there's any technical limitations, but again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so somebody can comment on this. But if you've got the front wheel drive, the Panasonic pack, you could peak at 150. And from what I've been reading, it's achievable to do a 10 to 80% DC fast charge in this in about 30 to 40 minutes. That's what I'm reading. But on that all wheel drive battery pack, which is basically very similar in size, it's hardly noticeable bigger. 
it can take an hour to go from 10 to 60, uh, 10 to 80 percent. And if you, you look at Kyle's uh, deep charging curve that he did on this, uh, yeah, it took him 62 minutes to get to 80 percent from that was from zero. So again, 10 to 80 within 60 is probably fair, but it's it, once it gets up to those you know, 60, 70, 80, it really starts to, to chug on, on charging for that CATL battery. Now, the Panasonic's peak a little higher, right? Uh, uh, the all-wheel drive pack peaks at 82 or something, 83, something like that, maybe 88 in the 80s, whereas Panasonic goes a little bit more, it'll peak, and, and it doesn't drop as steep as the uh, CATL pack, but it does drop it in a very similar fashion. It just gets you a little longer. So it's a little bit more achievable in the stop time. So Again, to summarize, the DC fast charging is kind of the Achilles heel for this vehicle. If it's important to you, only if it's very important to you, because if it's not, and most people think it is, oh, well, then I can't take a trip. Well, you can. But, you know, if I'm going to go from here to Windsor, Ontario, which is about 350 kilometer drive, let's say, I'm most likely going to have to stop once, even in this, which is which is rated at 406 kilometers. But you're highway driving, you're moving, you're not going to get that that true range. I'm going to have to stop once somewhere, and I'm going to have to charge probably for 15 minutes to half an hour, uh, probably half an hour. Is that acceptable for me? Absolutely, because I'm already been driving for two and a half to three and a half to three hours, and stopping for 20 minutes to half an hour is not an inconvenience. So try to level set your expectations of road tripping experiences. What I wanted you is just be aware of that's where I see the weakness in this, especially where it's a brand new all electric offering from Toyota, where, and they seem to be about four to five years behind where everybody else is. Because four to five years ago, that was kind of the acceptable, right? 45 minutes to an hour to an hour 15 for charging at 50 kilowatt was the high. That's what we expected in the earlier days, and that's what we did. We live with it. Now, again, that norm is that 20 to 30 minutes for most people, and um, I think Toyota does fall short. With the single motor, you're close to that. You're Again, you're, you're kind of there, but there is a bit of a caveat. There's no preconditioned offer in this vehicle, and that means no preconditioned conditioning for any of the trims, regardless if it's single or dual motor. So that means in the winter, you're going to get there with a fairly colder battery than you normally would if you had preconditioned, which would uh, give you a much more quicker charge rate. So be aware of that. Do a little research on some of the real life, but don't get to go down, don't go down the negative YouTube rat hole about this car being terrible, because I don't think it is terrible. My, the, the experience, I haven't needed to charge it this week. I've only had it for three or four days. I've been driving to work into Toronto and I'm still still going on the original 100% charge that it came with. So, uh, you know, as far as a daily driver going back and forth to work, putting 50, 60, 70 kilometers a day, we go three, four, five, six days without having to charge it. Especially in this kind of temperature, still in the summer and in that kind of, that kind of daily range. So it's a great daily use vehicle, urban, intercity, uh, I, I would certainly recommend it for that. But if you're going to do some serious long road tripping, you would need not only to map out and understand what charging infrastructure is available on those trips, but then what kind of experience you're going to have with this. And if you're okay with it, then good. Just have a quick look at the interior. Again, form, function, right? Quality, that's Toyota. Uh, you know, it's got some soft touch plastics here and there. So it's nice, some... Uh, material on the door so everything's comfortable i like that it's got these deep pockets to put your big water bottles uh, you can do that in the center as well some guys get miss that so it's uh, nice all your easy buttons this one has the six-way manual adjustments and there's power options if you go to different trim levels again very comfortable um, cockpit i'll talk a little bit about that now i guess versus the driving let me just get in here and turn this uh puppy on here and we'll probably get some blinking up uh, from a cockpit um let me turn the fan off here so this is you know toyota's gone with this um similar to the prius and other vehicles where they've got these higher higher mount binnacle driver binnacle screens i'm not used to them so for me it took me about till today basically to start getting used to this but i see the logic because instead of having a hud you can combination that by putting a display a little farther back, a little farther closer to the front bottom of the windshield. 
where your line of sight is anyway when you're looking down the road like uh, this. This is how I, you know, this is my eye line sight here driving. And it's very easy just to glance down quickly at the display to see what's going on speed wise and that kind of stuff, ADS. So I get the logic behind it. I'm not a huge fan, just like I'm not really big on HUDs. I don't really care for them because I grew up without them. So for me, I don't need them. But I see the logic and I see why this works. Not something for me. However, in saying that again, I've gotten used to it over the last couple of days. So it gets better every time I get in this vehicle. It doesn't bother me as much. I tend to like to sit high so I can try to see over the, the front as much as possible. So with this be projecting into that, I have to kind of raise my seat even a little bit higher. And sometimes I bonk my head getting in and out of the car. That's personally me and that's my ergonomics. You would have to get in this vehicle and check it. I've got the steering wheel as, as low down as it'll go because if I raise it, again, I'm gonna get that steering wheel interfering with the display. If I put this up a little higher, so in my setup, I've got the, it's not bonking my legs, but it's pretty low. I would probably usually have it just a tad higher, but because of my setup, I've had to drop it down and push it back. It does telescope and tilt up and down. Other than that, you've got a nice array of controls and the steering wheel for all your stuff. This has a pretty good suite of ADAS features, even out of the box. This has a little bit bigger screen in the LE. The XLE gets you even a bigger screen, but the base screen, I think at eight inch, is probably just well enough. It, it does what it needs to do. There's nothing fantastic going on here. Um, there is no mapping that will give you your estimation to, uh, in your destination to what your battery charge is going to be your state of charge when you get there. It doesn't have any of that sophistication level. So you're gonna to have to use Google or something on your phone. It does support a wireless a CarPlay and Android Auto. That's works and it works great, I've used it. So as far as the um, usability and functionality of these, they work really well. That's again, Toyota's quality. They know what they're doing when it comes to build and the functions. It's just that it doesn't have a lot that we're used to going on here. So I'm not gonna get into menu stuff because there's nothing to see from an EV, all you can do is see some EV history. Um, and I'll talk, I'll share my range and efficiencies at the end of this. One thing I don't like, and if you can see that on the dash, and if I zoom in a little bit here, is the fact that there's your battery um, juice state of charge indicator, and there's no percentage or anything else. You've got your estimated range there. And as you can see by that blue bar, I'm, I'm at about 50% roughly range, I guess but it doesn't say it anywhere. And I really wish Toyota would put a percentage there because we're all used to seeing something, not just range. So, I, I'm, I mean, especially for people that, that know EVs, we like to see that, you know, but I guess I can see where they're coming from because for people that are getting into it, you know, I say it even a lot, like don't really worry about the battery, just plug it in when you want to, Plug it in when you need to, when the car instructs you that you're getting low enough and find a charger and plug it in, or plug it in every night and charge it up to the vehicle manufacturer's recommended charging levels. In this case, with a level one, level two, Toyota says, hey, charge it up to 100% every night. We're fine with that. So that leads to me to, and that's fine, to be honest, with pretty well everybody out there, except for Tesla, that wants you to keep it, you know, between 80 and 90%, um, even on a level, level one or level two. So... Toyota and a couple of other manufacturers have stated, hey, go to 100, we're fine with that. Because those uh, level of charges, they're so low, they're not impacting negatively the battery pack like a DC fast charge does. So you need to take that into account. So the plus side is you can go at 100%. The negative side is it doesn't tell you that it's at 100%, it just gives you that visual bar. So it is what it is. Otherwise, everything else is here. Um, you kind of got this funky shift control where you have to um, push in to change, push and push again, push in to drive, but that's a safety thing. I don't mind that at all. This has eco mode and some other modes. You've got some storage here for your phone. This is not wireless charging. You have to get the XLE to get wireless charging. We've got some cup holders. My other little pet peeve is I think the cup holders are a little deep in this cavity. And if you're trying, you put a regular or medium sized cup in or a small cup, you've got to get in there and grab it from the top. It's really hard to kind of grab it from the side. So I would have liked this not to be so deep. That's why I like more flush mount um, coffee cup holders because easy to grab something. But that's that's a pet fee, peeve here. It's got a fair size storage here for that. Um, and you've got a little shelf here for coins. I'm using the key thing. One thing it is, is this also slides up. If you want it to so you can almost cover that just extends the armrest which is nice and comfortable and works well so 
from a front perspective, everything is good. Um, does not have sliding mirrors, which I think is something full paw, they're, they're fixed. Uh, everything should be sliding now because you need to, sometimes the sun is in weird positions. This one doesn't have a roof. You can get them with roofs and other options, um, but it comes well equipped. I like the cloth interior. I think that it's fine than leather. Now, one other thing is because it, it does this does not have a frunk, but it does not also have a glove box. There is no glove box there. It's just material. So I think Toyota's decided because they have this cavity underneath here, we can put a lot of stuff. And you've got a fair size um, middle section here and this cubby that you don't need a glove box. So there's no glove box. If you go hunting for it like I did, you won't find one. Now let's check the back seat. So just quickly in the back seat, again, very similar, good size cup holders, middle armors with cup holders. I think that's standard on the L2, but I'm not sure, but certainly on the LE and the, the premium. Not much going on, just some vents. I don't believe there's any charging ports back here. I think in the top trim, you get po charging ports here. That's what those cutouts are for. Sorry, that's what those cutouts are for. Flat floor, just a tiny little hump here. So not bad, relatively flat, comfortable seats, adequate, very purposeful, very functional. Um, so that's how they work. So uh, let's see how I get into this vehicle and how easy it is. Right, so I've been saying the interior is pretty nice. Um, again, good size entrance doors. They don't open 90, but let me try getting in. Yeah, really easy. I like that. It's got a high enough head uh, roof line that you don't have to duck so much. People taller than me being 5'6", five, 5'7", five, I'm going to have to duck a bit. But otherwise, I've got the seat where I have it. I've got three fists of leg room. Tons of leg room back here, even for tall people. I've got over a fist of headroom, so there's going to be a decent amount of headroom on here. Nice center armrest, comfortable, functional. Works for four, five in a pinch, as always, right? That middle guy's going to be squished unless uh, you're really skinny. But otherwise, um, it's pretty good. They've done a good job in here. It's a comfortable material, nice use of materials on the doors, decent door pockets, all that stuff. So uh, I like that I can get in and out easy. So grab handles on every door, which is always nice to have. Always good to see that for us old folks. All right, so from a cargo capacity, let's have a look at that here. So it's got a power hood. You can open it from the uh, power trunk lid. You can open it from the key fob as well and a button in the dash. I've set it down just a little lower than it normally goes. It normally goes way up because uh, I've, of our garage door. I've been parking it in the garage. So I don't want it to bonk the door, but it actually goes quite high, as you can see here. So way up high. Uh, but nice to be able to set that. It's got a good size boot in it. Um, according to Toyota, behind the second row here, uh, you've got 784 liters or 27.7 cubic feet of storage back here. And if you put the seats down, it gives you um, 1611 liters or 56.9 cubic feet. Not sure how these numbers actually relate to real, if people are relating to those, but short and long of it is you can throw a lot of stuff in here, which is good. It does have a bit of a sub uh, issue, a sub frunk. You could put some laptops, some books, a some, uh, couple of inches thick of documents, and it's got a little, little bit of a deep well for your charging cord, and that's where the, uh, the mobile connector is for this. It's got a couple of hooks, um, and you can get a tonneau cover for it. This one doesn't have it, but you can get one to cover this up and put everything out of sight if you want. So nice big opening, good to do Ikea runs, to, to do Costco runs, all that kind of stuff, and throw sports and dogs and all the stuff that you need for your kids and for your life in here. Uh, again, a very good size vehicle. Quick driving thoughts. Um, this has been a really pleasant vehicle to drive for the week, uh, for a few days. It's capable, confident, as I keep saying. Uh, everything fit, finishes nice, no squeaks, rattles. Uh, easy to drive around, steering's responsive, brakes are really good. Um, again, I, I don't have anything bad to say about the driving. As I mentioned earlier in the interior, it took me a little while to get used to the pinnacle and where that is, but now I'm pretty well getting used to it getting settled in so like anything that's different than the norm it takes you a little bit uh, I love the HVAC really easy to use buttons instead of soft touch uh, especially for up and down temps and fans those are the stuff we use the most um, really nice uh, again, I'd like to have convenience wise this a little bit lower but it is but as far as driving I really have nothing bad to say about the driving again um, one thing I did notice is the front wheel drive. Obviously the motor sending all the power to just the front um, axle and to the two front wheels. And when it's a little slippery out, we've had, uh, had a little bit of rain earlier today and had some rain yesterday. And you know, if I've been driving in eco mode the whole time, but even just giving it a little bit good get up and go like that, it would spin 
start chirping the tires a little bit. The anti-lock would kick in to try to stop that, this any spinning. So uh, I think what Toyota's done is probably used a tire um, which isn't the greatest for that this kind of application. These are Bridgestone Toranzas, I believe. I'll, I'll, I'll double check the end there. And I think they're a little weak when it comes to wet grip, especially with the torque that this thing puts out, all that torque right away to the axle and to those two front tires. So that's probably the only thing. Uh, there's a little bit of torque steer as well. You have to kind of grip that wheel if you're going to floor it from the light or give it some, you know, and I'm in eco mode, never mind normal mode. Um, where you'll get more power. Uh, so you do need to keep your hands on the wheel for those applications. Other than that, um, again, I've noticed really nothing out of the ordinary, but a very pleasant vehicle to drive. Again, my range numbers and my numbers that I'd be able to put up uh, in a short few days will be coming up. So you'll get an indication of you know how this thing performs, but it's got more than enough get up and go. Uh, suspension's nice, the double uh, front and rear independent suspension. I think a double wishbone in the back. So, you know, nice, comfortable ride. Again, you got some kids, you got pets, family, whatever. Two of you, one of you, it's going to be a nice, comfortable ride. And um, it's not luxury, Cadillac or anything, but it's comfortable. It definitely is. So Toyota has built a good, good quality vehicle here. And on the all electric side, um, I think they've done a great job. Again, as I mentioned, I would like to see a little bit more detail on the instrumentation side as far as state of charge and some battery metrics. But um, Toyota is just saying, hey, you know, charge to 100 every day, we don't care. And when it gets down to low, it'll tell you, and when you see it turn yellow or whatever, then plug it in, and or plug it in every night at home. So as a, as a driving vehicle, this is great, good to maneuver, easy to park. This one just has just the one backup camera, which is good, it's a nice backup camera. Um, you can get some of the other trims, I think, which have front uh, sensors as well. This one does not, so, um, but again, it's, I found it. I found it very easy to park and maneuver in mall parking lots and this kind of stuff because it's not too big. It's a good size. So, as far as driving, they've done a good job. You would enjoy the drive in this. Almost forgot about the one pedal driving. We just wanted to say there is a button here. If you turn it on, you get a max regen, which is one setting. It's not true one pedal though. Uh, this vehicle will not. It will not take you to a stop on its own. You need to use the, the brake for the last several feet whatever you get down to about four or five kilometers an hour like a just a creeping mode basically and you need to use the pedal the brake pedal um, so it doesn't have true one pedal driving um, if I let off it's a decent regen it's not strong where I'm really being jerked but it's it's a good good balance regen in this mode but again it won't take it to a full stop so you got to remember that there is a hold button you can engage the hold button and what that does is once you stop it will clamp the brakes and keep you on hold until you press the accelerator and it will release it you have to put that on every single time you get into the vehicle. It, it hasn't saved it to the profile that's on here, so I don't know if it matches profiles. Uh, and same with the, the max regen. I believe you have to turn that on every time you get into the vehicle if you're going to want to use it. So again, I wish some of the OEMs would re would retain all the settings that you choose to, to use, whether they're good for you or in some cases not. Maybe you don't like them. I don't know. I wish they wouldn't fuddle around and reset everything afterwards. I wish they would just leave it set um, to the last thing entertainment system does that it remembers where you were pretty close and it comes back so that's good uh, but anyway want to tell you so it doesn't have true one pedal driving it's close I gained Toyota being conservative uh, I don't like the hold mode because the brakes are fairly you can kind of hear them grasping and when you give it some some acceleration you know you can hear it un unclapping and they, it can get a little noisy so I, I just I think it's a little clunky I don't like that and a lot of the implementations are they just just the nature of them um, I really wish uh, it'd be a little bit softer, but uh, it does work. And uh, if you want as close to a one pedal experience as you can, you can get it in this car. All right, so just trying the lane keeping assist and the uh, adaptive cruise control here in the Toyota BZ4X. Uh, on my uh, usual highway, that's not too busy. So I have the, t the speed set for 115 here. Uh, and as you can see, now it's starting to bong at me. Hopefully you can see that to, to nudge the steering wheel. I'll do that and then I'll let go. So I'm not touching the steering wheel. As you can see, it stays in the lane quite well, um, even though these uh, lanes uh, markings seem to be fading a little bit, but it's uh, keeping very nice and smooth. So there it's asking me again to uh, take control because it's uh, if you don't hold the wheel, it will give you the warning. So it's about every 10, 15 seconds, I guess, for the warning. So uh, other than, than that, which is the usual for lane keep assist, because it's again, it's only level two autonomy, 
Uh, it's pretty smooth. It handles the, uh, keeps doesn't ping pong, keeps in the lanes quite nicely, keeps the speed quite nicely. Let's see if, uh, oh, I thought this car might want to merge in front of me and I would have checked the braking, but I guess not. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I haven't got the, let me see if I got the distance set here. Nudge the wheel here and I'll set the distance for, uh, I think the most, I think it's already on the max right now for the distance, so we'll leave it at that, but pretty smooth. The bus is gonna stay in that lane, so yeah. It's a pretty good system. Again, these uh, systems have been refined enough where they're really good for level two autonomy, uh, just to take the stress off of long highway driving. So, pretty good job, Toyota. All right, so just to wrap up in summary on this 2023 Toyota BZ4X LE, I had to think about that, front wheel drive. Um, as you can you know, tell by my viewpoints on this and the driving and everything, I think it's a great vehicle. I think Toyota's done a pretty capable and competent job in it. Um, and that's to be expected from Toyota. And you know, one thing that I'm, I was a little surprised on is the price point, because pricing on this is not that bad by comparison. In here in Canada, the L is at 44,990. The LE, which is this one, is 49,990. And the well-equipped XLE is 54990 All these prices are MSRP basis. Uh, freight, PDI, extras are on top of that, plus your taxes. Good thing is all trims qualify for the $5,000 federal Canadian incentive rebate here in Canada. So you can get five grand off of all of them. And all the, in most provinces, if not all the provinces that have incentives, this qualifies as well. So you can double stack and get even more. So in, in Quebec, you could get $11,000 off this vehicle. And if you're looking at that base LE model at just under 45,000, you do 45, couple of grand for shipping, all that kind of stuff, um, plus, your, and plus your tax. So you're at probably about 52, 53. You take your 5K off, you're at 56, 46, 47. For a Toyota that's decently equipped as a good day-to-day uh, -day transportation, that's much less than the average car price here in Canada for a decent sized small SUV. Not bad at all. And the money you save on electricity and maintenance is huge. So think, you know, run those kind of numbers, folks. I encourage you to look at that because the SUVs can be expensive, but the Toyota's done a good job in their price points. And I, I'm glad that they came up with that. Sure, I'd love to see it lower, but I get it. OEM's got to make money. Just want to quickly look at the range numbers here in this chart. Since I only had it for a few days, um, it's a pretty simplified chart. But um, started with 100% state of charge, ended with I have I don't I'm not 100% sure. Uh, as I said, the display doesn't show anywhere the state of charge at a point in time of the battery. So you have to go with, by the visual representation on that blue bar in the driver's binnacle. So my best guess was that it was around 35. It seemed to be a little bit less than, it was definitely less than half. It looked like a little, probably below 40%. So I would say pretty close to 35% state of charge when I uh, ended my, my few days of driving. As you can see, it started with a, a, a showed range of 452 kilometers, ended with a uh, range existing of 116 kilometers. That's 336 at the vehicle projected, but I only drove 272 kilometers, and that was mixed driving. Probably uh, it was about 60% city and 40% highway, um, and in eco mode. And you saw that see the temperatures there. It was been a pretty decent week temperature wise. Uh, one early morning that was uh, down to 15. So what that means, if you look at this chart, I have the uh, negative 64 highlighted. That means that the estimation of the car was 64 kilometers higher than what I actually got. That's a pretty big difference. You know, that's well over 10%. Uh, it's like 20% range difference when you look at what the projected uh, start with. It's almost that. So uh, again, I can't reliably talk about the real world range, but just in this small example, certainly seems like the Toyota is overestimating the range uh, by 10 to 20%, just in what I see here. Um, so Take that with whatever it's worth and uh, hopefully you can watch some more videos to get some more real range. But I hope that they fix this problem and I really hope that they show the state of charge. And again, just to add to this, I wasn't driving like a madman or anything crazy. Eco mode, nice and easy, just normal going with traffic. Even on the highway, nothing more than 120, usually about 115 kilometers an hour. So 
I wasn't really taxing it. And the efficiency, as you can see, was pretty good. So I don't know what to say. Um, obviously, the state of charge was probably higher than what it showed. Uh, and the, the way that it projected the range, the algorithms they use need some work. So what's my overall opinion of this vehicle? You know, obviously it's gonna get a thumbs up recommendation for me, right? No ifs, ands, or buts about this. I'm super happy that Toyota is now, appears to be doing a 180 on their statements. The last couple of months, they've made tons of announcements that they're gonna really beef up their all electric offerings the rest of this decade to become a major player. So they, they tend to be seeing the light in the all electrification game, not just hybrids and plugins. They say their entire fleet is electrified and they're not lying, but most of those are HEV vehicles. And as you know, I'm not for HEV vehicles. I think we're way past them now. And if you're not, again, looking at a vehicle with a plug as a minimum, you're doing yourself a disservice. So keep that in mind. And if you have questions on why I say that, email me. I'd be glad to explain it to you or have a conversation on why. But overall on this vehicle, I think it's got really good features and good value for the pricing. It's Toyota quality built, it's sound, it's smooth, it's quiet, it's a decent ride, it performs well, steers, all that kind of stuff. You can add more cameras, you can add more niceties to it, but even base one out of the box is a pretty good Corolla-ish like experience for an all electric battery market, but at, a little bit, but at a Toyota quality perspective. So I think they've done a really good job. So you've got all the, those things going for it. Good use of materials as well. It's comfortable, as I mentioned, and it drives very solidly. It's very quiet. People were very impressed at how quiet it was. Uh, right, and if there's any downsides to this, because nothing's perfect, everything has a little bit of a downside to it. The shine's not as bright. I mentioned the DC charging speeds, right? Again, if that's important to you, sit down and look at it a little bit deeper. Again, I wouldn't rule this car out, as some people are, but at the experiences can be fairly painful. So if you want to drive for two to three hours and stop for an hour, maybe an hour and a quarter, and you're okay with that, then this will do fine in the all-wheel drive version. Uh, again, I would probably, in my case, if I were looking to buy this today, I would not buy the all-wheel drive version. I would buy this front-wheel drive, the single motor with the bigger, with the longer range and the better, fa the better DC charging performance. And that's even if I wasn't going to do road tripping a lot, just use it as an inner city, a second car, right? A commuter car, secondary vehicle, whatever. I would still just only get the front wheel drive version. I wouldn't get the all wheel drive. I don't think you need it. It's got good, decent ground clearance and front wheel drive is fine in the winter. Uh, and the other thing is the, uh, there is no true one pedal driving. And as an EV owner and people that have been driving EVs for quite some time, we get used to that. And we actually like that experience. And I, I do like it when, when OEMs give consumers the choice. Yeah, you don't want it, then turn it off. You want it, then turn it on. I wish they would have gone that little extra and put in true one pedal and maybe offered another, you know, level of regeneration. And then last world from what I'm hearing is that the real world range is not up to speed for what the claims are. So, you know, again, I'm, I've talked, talked about my, my range, uh, showed you what my range is in the limited time that I've had it. So, and this is in pristine conditions, right? This is in decent summer weather and the winter is going to be less with everybody. Um, so I, you know, I, I kind of have to reserve judgment on that because I can't really put it through a full pace. But again, there's, I'm pretty confident to say even as a city car, just booting around as a secondary vehicle or as a local primary vehicle, I don't see any issues in getting, you know, three to 400 kilometers of range out of this. Uh, in the winter time, probably the 250 to 300. So in saying all that in closing, I think Toyota has done a good job. I think they could have done better. And to be honest, I think they should have done better. But with their ultra conservative viewpoints, I can understand where they're coming from. And there is some logic to the madness there. I get it, right? They want these things to last. They don't want people to be making any claims on the batteries at all. So they're gonna be very conservative in what they offer you. They're keeping back a big reserve in that battery as well. If you watch Kyle's video, it's probably close to like almost 10 kilowatts of reserve. When this thing shows zero, you probably still have 10, 10 kilowatt hour of energy left in there, which is a lot. So they're being very conservative on that uh, because they don't want to have any issues with this. And I, I think they'll get better as they progress and as cells and technology, you know, they're, they're, they made some statements about solid state and this kind of stuff. I think that's where they want to get to. So you know, again, I'm glad that they're involved in it and the best of luck to them. And as a consumer, if you like Toyota, can, you know, this is a great pick. So certainly go out and get it. And if you have questions, let me know.
All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks for sticking around and uh, watching me on this. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, again, you know, it's one of these, um, I wasn't too conf conflicted on this vehicle, uh, but I just wanted to make sure I put everything into perspective for you as a consumer experience, because to me, that's important. Again, I want to thank Toyota Canada for allowing me to use this press vehicle. Much appreciated. All my contact information and stuff is coming up and the end credits, uh, also a listing of my Patreon supporters. You know who you are, thank you very much. I'll be at Fully Charged Live uh, in a couple of weeks, so if you're going out, please come and see me. I'll be there the whole three days, uh, doing lots of panels, talking, walking, hopefully getting out and about, meeting a lot of people. I'd love to hear your story. Please come and visit me. So until the next episode, everybody stay safe, keep well, and I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.